After watching this video lecture, students are going to be able to describe the atomic models that are associated with various uh, models of the atom through history. We're going to look at Democritus, Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, Chadwick, and Bohr's contribution um, to the overall model of the atom at the time and subsequently the model of the atom that we have today. So let's go ahead and start with Democritus. So around 400 BC, uh, Democritus uh, was alive and was a Greek philosopher. Um, and basically he stated that matter could be divided into smaller and smaller units. Basically until you got to the point where you could no longer divide the matter um, into a simpler uh, type. And so he believed that matter was therefore made of atomos or uncut uncuttable pieces of matter. Okay, and so atomos, um, that Greek word we uh, use it or used it to get the name atom, is what we are discussing the structure of today. Um, so this was just a theory, this is just thought process. Um, there weren't any experimental procedures that were carried out. Uh, basically this was just a, a postulation on the part of Democritus. Um, and if we were to go ahead and draw a diagram of what Democritus's atom or model of the atom would look like at the time, we'll just draw you know, something, something like this, right? Okay, nothing simpler, just you know, a little sphere of the tomos. So if we fast forward, you know, to the early 1800s, uh, John Dalton uh, comes up with Dalton's atomic theory. Um, so uh, the first statement in Dalton's atomic theory is that all matter consists of tiny atoms. Okay, now of course this should uh, be very, very similar or appear very, very similar to uh, what we already discussed with respect to Democritus. Okay, tiny uh, atoms are the smallest uh, form of matter. Okay, um, so not much change uh, since you know 500, 400, 500 BC um, until the early 1800s. Um, Dalton did, however, make a few statements um, regarding uh, some characteristics of atoms. Um, so he stated that atoms of one element cannot be converted into atoms of another another element. Okay, so alchemy was um, not something that was going to really work. Um, although this is not entirely true, and we'll discuss this when we discuss radioactivity. Um, three, atoms of an element are identical in mass and other properties and are different from atoms of any other element. Okay, um, there is some truth to this statement, however, there are some differences, so we'll discuss that later on as well. And compounds result from the chemical combination of a specific ratio of atoms um, of different elements. And we know this to be true, and we will discuss this in great detail when we discuss um, chemical reactions and writing chemical formulas. Okay, so if we look at Dalton's model and we compare it to uh, Democritus's, if we were to draw an example of, you know, an atom, we would, you know, just kind of diagram very simply. Okay, there's nothing simpler than that smallest piece of matter. Um, but according to Dalton, different uh, types of atoms had different masses. Um, and different characteristics um, to identify them by. So then, approximately 100 years later, J.J. Thompson came along um, and he ended up discovering a subatomic particle called the electron. Um, and he discovered the electron by carrying out something called the cathode ray tube experiment. Um, this right here is the cathode ray tube. It's just uh, a piece of uh, glassware that's been uh, evacuated of um, all the air, okay? Um, and basically there's metal pieces here um, that uh, are able to be hooked up um, to an electrical current. Um, and what you see here and here um, is the ray that comes from the metal. And we'll talk about that here in a second, but um, this is actually, you know, a, a picture of, of what that ray that we're going to be discussing looks like. Now, um, J.J. Thompson's model of the atom, um, which he coined the plum pudding model, um, basically consists of a positively charged matrix um, that has uh, randomly distributed electrons um, throughout the uh, matrix, okay? Um, so... He's saying that there's actually particulate uh, in terms of these negatively charged electrons, and basically there's just uh, area um, surrounding it that is positively charged. Okay, so we're gonna delineate uh, the difference between the particles and just you know um, charged area by actually circling the particles, the particles, 
um, and obviously leaving um, the plus signs uncircled uh, to denote that they are not actually discovered particulates. So the cathode ray tube experiment that J.J. Thompson carried out uh, basically consisted of him having an evacuated tube, glass tube, where he had metal, um, pieces of metal, and he applied an electrical current to the pieces of metal. And what ended up happening is that there was a ray um, that would go from one side of the tube to the other. And when he ran this experiment, um, it would always be uh, observed that the ray that was produced um, would leave the negatively charged uh, electrode and strike the positively charged um, electrode on the other side. Okay, so um, this is what he observed, um, and he thought it was very strange. Uh, he changed out the metal, um, so, you know, he's like, maybe it's unique to this specific type of uh, material, but then he, he swapped it out for different metals, and the same result happened over and over again. So then J.J. Uh, Thompson decided to apply uh, an external electrical field um, to the cathode uh, ray tube. And when he did that, what he noticed is that the ray that was coming from the metal um, actually bent towards the positive portion of the electrical field that was being applied. And so what he concluded from these observations is that the particles in the ray, okay, so the particles or the, or the, the ray that's leaving the metal surface um, is made up of particles with a negative charge. Um, and it didn't matter, again, what type of metal he was using in the cathode ray tube, um, the same results happened. So he determined um, that the uh, negatively charged particles, or the electrons, um, are an intrinsic um, feature of uh, matter and of atoms. Okay, so um, this is what led to his plum pudding model. Again, remember um, the indication of the electrons being actual particles um, is represented by the circles around the negative charges. And then the positive charges that are um, represented here are not circled because that matrix space in the atom um, uh, is positively charged, but it's not particulate, or at least not at this point in time. Okay, so this is J.J. Thompson's contribution to the atom. Okay, so notice we went from a very simple um, atom with nothing uh, uh, simpler, right, um, with Dalton and uh, Democritus, to now we have positive and negative components, and in particular, we have identified the negatively charged electron particles. So now we have one subatomic particle according to J.J. Thompson's model of the atom. So this is what it was thought to consist of at this point in time. Right? So around a uh, similar um, period of time to J.J. Thompson, not that, that long after, Ernest Rutherford discovers the nucleus um, and subsequently the protons inside the nucleus. Okay, And so um, he actually ends up disproving the model that we uh, just learned about with J.J. Uh, Thompson. Okay, and what he did is he carried out something called the gold foil experiment. And what he did in this gold foil experiment um, is he uh, basically ran positively charged alpha particles um, into a really, really thinly um, rolled piece of um, gold foil. Um, and his observations from that experiment um, are what led him to conclude that there was a small positively charged nucleus um, inside the atom. Okay, and we'll look at that here. Okay, so when Rutherford first ran this experiment, what he postulated or expected to happen um, is that the positively charged alpha particles um, would basically just pass through uh, the atom. Okay, and it'd go straight through and all of the um, alpha particles uh, would be picked up by the detector on the backside of the thin piece of metal. Okay, and so he ran the experiment and he anticipated um, you know, basically the alpha particles just slide right through and slide past the negatively charged electrons, okay? And so when he ran this experiment, he was actually pleasantly surprised. Upon actually carrying the experiment out, um, what Rutherford uh, ended up observing was on the surface of the detector, he saw that, you know, a good portion of the alpha particles did actually um, pass through the metal um, and... Uh, 
strike the detector right behind the metal. Okay. However, he also saw deflections at various angles, and he also saw some of the particles basically bounce directly off of something, be recorded by the front side of the detector. So while he did observe that most of the particles passed through uh, the atoms of the gold foil, um, there must have been something or, or, or a presence inside the atom that would allow the positively charged alpha particles to deflect off. Okay, and so his conclusions are, were obviously that the plum pudding model is incorrect and that there's a centralized positively charged nucleus. Okay, so um, instead of having a positively charged matrix, okay, um, what Rutherford established is that there are positively, a positively charged area in the atom that is subsequently surrounded by the negatively charged electrons. Okay, and so... Um, the fact that there's the presence of a positively charged nucleus um, subsequently uh, being attributed to the subatomic particles protons um, was discovered by Rutherford. And furthermore, he helped uh, show that the atom itself is actually mostly empty space. Okay, so even though some of these alpha particles in fact deflected off the nucleus, still a large quantity of them passed through. Okay, and the driving force behind that, of course, um, is the fact that there's lots of empty space and only a small positive area inside the nucleus. So a little bit later, Niels Bohr came along and added another layer to the um, atomic theory. Okay, so Niels Bohr um, established that electrons are not just randomly distributed around the nucleus um, through some studies uh, with uh, photons of energy and excitation and de-excitation of electrons, um, he was able to establish that each orbit has a discrete distance from the nucleus and each has a discrete energy value. Okay, um, first model of the atom um, would basically have the positively charged nucleus with the protons and have these electrons sitting in specific pathways or orbits um, with specific energetic as well as distance values from the nucleus. So Bohr establishes that the electrons that J.J. Thompson um, discovered are uh, orbiting around the nucleus of the atom. Okay, and then in, around 1932, James Chadwick discovers the neutron. Um, there was a bunch of interesting uh, atomic uh, studies going on around this time, if you think about what was going on in the 30s um, and 40s. Uh, in the United States of America and in other areas of the world. Um, but James Chadwick discovered the neutron, okay? And so neutrons are um, neutral subatomic particles. They exist in the nucleus, okay? Um, and basically his contribution is that he identified um, something that contributes mass and things of that sort. And we'll talk more about that later. But his model of the atom is going to have both protons positively charged protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And then surrounding the nucleus are going to be electrons that um, circle the nucleus um, in its dis their discrete orbits. Okay, So at this point, uh, we have a total of three subatomic particles. The proton, which is positively charged and resides in the nucleus. The neutron, which is neutral and also resides in the nucleus. And then the electrons, which are negatively charged and... Um, reside in the orbits around the nucleus. So the modern atomic model is going to match up pretty closely with what we saw in Chadwick's model. Um, you're going to have protons and neutrons in the nucleus. You're going to have electrons on the outside of the nucleus um, orbiting around um, in discrete pathways. Now, um, we'll talk more about this later, but the pathways that these electrons orbit in um, are not actually circular or elliptical. Um, they have various shapes, um, very unique shapes, and we're going to study that in great detail. But for right now, we'll just diagram it um, in a similar manner to what we saw uh, with Chadwick. Now that we are familiar with all the various models of the atom through history, uh, we can now start to um, organize this in a um, timeline to kind of give us an idea of how uh, the current model of the atom came to fruition.